Welcome to Scripture Central. We're thrilled to have you here. Just a quick note, this video is a revamped edition of this video series from four years ago. The content, however, is as relevant and insightful as ever. We also invite you to explore our extensive collection of resources and programs designed to enhance your study of the scriptures. You can do this by visiting scripturecentral.org. Now, let's dive into the lesson. So we, we embark on this first book written by Nephi. Uh, before we dive into our scripture block for today, I just wanted to show you in, in the 1830 replica edition of the Book of Mormon that if you look carefully, there are no footnotes, there are no verse markers, there, there aren't double columns, there, it's simply written in paragraph format. And the first chapter of Nephi is long. It comes clear over to the original page 16, and it ends with chapter 5, verse 22 in our current edition. And then it picks up chapter 2 with, and now I, Nephi, do not give the genealogy of my fathers in this account. So, he opens up chapter 2 in what we would call verse 6, or sorry, chapter 6. So, a couple of things just for you to be oriented with. The 1830 edition has, has completely different chapter breaks the way it was originally given. So, Nephi had somehow on the plates made some sort of a space or a marking to signify, okay, this is one complete unit. And it's, it's interesting to see the original uh, chapters in the Book of Mormon, and it would be worth your time sometime if you want to download uh, the Scripture Plus app for free and read the Book of Mormon in the 1830 edition that's embedded right there in the Scripture Plus app, and you can see those chapter breaks as they come. There were other editions of the Book of Mormon, but the significant one that kind of changed things was 1879 when Orson Pratt published the book, and under the direction of, of the prophet at the time, President Brigham Young, Orson Pratt organized the Book of Mormon text into what would match up more closely with the way the, the Holy Bible is written. So, kind of match the same size of how, how long the verses would be and how long chapter breaks would, would be, and that all happened in 1879 when Orson Pratt published that, uh, that edition with the chapters and verses as we now see them in our current edition. One other thing of note is uh, regarding punctuation. It was back in the 1830 edition where John Gilbert, he is the typesetter for E.B. Grandin's print shop. He's, he's the guy who takes each individual letter or punctuation mark and puts them into those uh, little blocks to then print the 1830 edition. It's John Gilbert who puts in all of our punctuation in the Book of Mormon. And so, be careful to not make doctrinal judgments on what the scriptures or what the Book of Mormon is saying based on punctuation because it, it wasn't, there, there was no punctuation on the plates, Joseph Smith didn't include any punctuation in his translation effort, Oliver Cowdery didn't put any punctuation in, it was delivered to the print shop, that printer's manuscript, uh, and it was John Gilbert who put all of that in. Now, we begin, we, em we embark on the first book of Nephi, his reign and ministry. It's interesting, he starts with his reign and ministry in the, the heading to his book. Who is it that reigns? Kings reign. And who is it that ministers? So, his reign and ministry. This is um, 
priests and prophets in, in history. I love the fact that the Book of Mormon begins with a prophet who has a reign and a ministry. So to embark on this journey, you pick up verse, chapter 1, verse 1. Now I'm going to experiment here. I'm going to try something. Let's see if this works. I want you to pay really close attention, all right? I, Nephi, having been born of goodly parents, therefore I was taught somewhat in all the learning of my father, and having seen many afflictions in the course of my days, nevertheless, having been highly favored of the Lord in all my days, yea, having had a great knowledge of the goodness and the mysteries of God, therefore I make a record of my proceedings in my days. Now, I told you I was gonna, going to try an experiment here. Let's see if it worked. My experiment was this. Let me see how long you would be able to stick with me as I read through one verse of Scripture. It happens to be the very first verse. Some would say it is the most uh, often read verse of the Book of Mormon <laughs> in some cases with our resolve to read the book and we keep starting over. And so we're, we're pretty familiar with verse 1. Here's the question. How long did you stay with it? Did your mind stay focused as I was reading that entire time? Or did your mind do what most, most of us do when we hear scripture that's fairly f familiar to us? You heard the first phrase and thought, oh, I know this, and then your mind wandered to something else. You'll notice as you embark on a serious study of the Book of Mormon, if you're just reading black words on a white page, it's going to be very, very difficult for you to stay focused and to actually learn the things that the book contains that are most relevant and applicable for this phase of your life that you're going through right now. So, we would give an invitation here to say, help, help, your, help your mind out, help your heart out, that you don't go in just looking at black words on the white page, but that you go in looking for something specific, something that would be more relevant and meaningful to you right here, right now. Because if you're looking for something, you're far more likely to stay focused and pay attention. One simple technique that some of you could, could use if you haven't before, or develop it further if you already have in the past, is some sort of a marking system, some sort of a way to, to organize the page, whether it's by color or by different types of markings or cross-reference or uh, sticky notes or thoughts and impressions that you can put in the margin, something to help your mind stay focused. So, let me give you one example of, of how to use this principle to stay focused on, on things that are more likely to help you move forward on the covenant path. Let's take verse 1, and I'm just going to start by saying this. There was never, and this is a bold statement, but I'm standing by it, there was never a better opener to any book ever written in the history of the world that, that we have access to than First Nephi chapter 1, verse 1. This thing is so beautiful. Contained in one verse, Nephi managed to fit the entire Book of Mormon story. Not just that, but he was able to fit in that one verse, your story and my story. It, it's all here. So look for how this one verse is a mirror for you to look in, okay? Notice the first phrase. I, Nephi, having been born of goodly parents. You'll notice that every one of us begin with some sort of a family uh, genesis. We're born into a family regardless of what your earthly parents may or may not have been for you as far as goodly, we were all born into heaven of goodly parents. 
Now notice the next word. The next word is therefore. Now in English, we'll often come to words like therefore and our mind and our eye will just kind of skip over it when in fact that right there becomes an incredible organizing word to describe what's on either side because it creates this relationship between what comes before it compared to what comes after it. A therefore statement takes phrase A and combines it with phrase B in a cause-effect relationship. So you have born of goodly parents and because of that, what happened? It says, therefore I was taught somewhat in all the learning of my father. Good parents, I was taught somewhat in all the learning of my father. My parents didn't teach me everything they know about everything because goodly parents don't do that. They give you a part of the breadth of their knowledge because they know that your experience is going to flesh out what needs to be uh, flushed out through your life, through your own life living. Every story in the entire Book of Mormon fits in this. Your story fits into this. We're taught enough to be able to then move forward. Now look at the next phrase. Having seen many afflictions in the course of my days, if you stop and think about the fact that Nephi is writing this probably between 30 to 40 years after they left Jerusalem based on 2 Nephi 5, that means he's able to, from a, from a perspective looking back in time at all of this, he's able to give us some detail that he wouldn't have been able to give uh, as they're just leaving Jerusalem. And he says, having seen many afflictions in the course of my days, you can just cast your mind back to some of the things that Nephi has experienced in, in the first book of Nephi, the, some of the struggles and the near loss of life at, at multiple junctures. If we were to translate this into 21st century English, we might say life was very, very hard for Nephi, but in this ancient context, it's having seen many afflictions. Now notice, if the next word had been therefore, we would be looking for this is a cause and the outcome, the effect would be, I've had a really hard life, therefore I'm justified in being angry or bitter or frustrated with God or any number of things could be the effect. But notice what Nephi does. He takes the difficulties, the many afflictions, and he doesn't say, therefore. He says, nevertheless. Nevertheless happens to be this beautiful word that uh, many have attributed to William Tyndale, coining this word. Look at how it's put together. Never the less. It could have just as easily been coined as always the greater. The, the element that's important and nevertheless is where you put the emphasis. It's never the less over here. It's always the greater emphasis here with what follows, which then diminishes your focus on what came before. It's as if it's a cause counter effect. It's the opposite of what you would have expected. Having seen many afflictions in the course of my days, notice what follows the nevertheless in verse 1. Nevertheless, having been highly favored of the Lord in, mark it, all my days. Not just the days when things were going well, when, when we were able to get food, when there was no storm on the boat, or when my brothers weren't trying to kill me. 
It's having been highly favored of the Lord in all my days. Did you notice that? Here's Nephi telling you that his life has been very difficult, but in spite of those difficulties, put the greater emphasis on God's goodness. I've been highly favored of the Lord in all my days. Hmm. Think about every story in the Book of Mormon. Think about every year in your life. Okay, we started with family, being taught, given agency, and then you embark on this life and here you move forward and then you run into opposition. Things don't always work out. Things don't always turn, turn the direction you wanted them to turn and you experience many afflictions and Nephi is showing us a Christ-like pattern of turning those into nevertheless moments where instead of turning it into a therefore I'm angry at God moment, it becomes a nevertheless I've been highly favored of the Lord. And you can see that in every story in the Book of Mormon, you can see that as you, as you look at your own life history. You can find the hand of the Lord guiding you, blessing you, sustaining you, encircling you, and loving you through, through all of your days, not just the days when things are working out. Which then brings us to the third and final phrase of First Nephi 1.1. It says, Yea, having had a great knowledge of the goodness and the mysteries of God, therefore. So we're back to another therefore statement. Uh, but he starts with the cause, phrase A, being, I have a great knowledge of the goodness and the mysteries of God, therefore I am going to make a record of my proceedings in my days. Did you notice that he has a great knowledge of the goodness and mysteries of God right after he tells you how hard his life has been and how much he's been highly favored the Lord? I don't think that Nephi would have been able to write this third phrase about the knowledge of the goodness and the mysteries of God if it hadn't been for that second phrase being in place. And I don't think you or I could truly know how good God is if life was only filled with sweetness and success and everything working out perfectly. It's somehow in that mixture of the bitter and the sweet, of the having to step out of the, the light into the darkness and experiencing pain and setback and loss and frustration and difficulty through, through mortal trials, that the light of God's goodness shines the brightest and we recognize how desperately we need him and how much he is a part of our life. And I think that's what Nephi is giving us right here in verse 1, is this, this nutshell overview of the entire Book of Mormon, his entire life, and our entire life by, by extension and by application, likening the scriptures to us. Now, brothers and sisters, we've spent a lot of time on 1 Nephi chapter 1, verse 1. We aren't going to spend this kind of time with every verse, but this therefore and nevertheless principle, that will bless your life as you move forward into the rest of the scriptures if you're looking for some of these words that will help you make better sense of what the scriptures mean and as you're looking for your own story on every page in every experience that's being shared, then you'll find that your mind is able to stay focused better and your study becomes more purposeful, more meaningful and more likely to lead to lasting change as you progress on that covenant path. Let's look just again at Nephi's opening statement. And just briefly, we've mentioned before that names are the lesson. Now, Joseph Smith did not know Hebrew or Egyptian when he was translating the Book of Mormon. But the writers of the Book of Mormon did know those languages, and significantly, many of the names in the Book of Mormon are Egyptian or Hebrew in origin. And as we've learned about the meanings, remarkably what we've seen is that they function as thesis statements for the life of that person or for the story in which their name is embedded. Let's take a look at the name Nephi. 
Any guess of what the name Nephi means in ancient Egyptian? Our best proposals suggest the name Nephi means good, lovely, or beautiful, or desirable. So Nephi is actually doing a wordplay as he introduces himself, as a good ancient Israelite scribe would be trained to do. We don't do this in English. Not very often, and Joe Smith would, have known, would not have known about this. So Nephi basically is saying, I, Nephi, haven't been born of Nephi parents, or I, the good, I, good, haven't been born of good parents. But it's also suggesting, who's the real good? It's Jesus. And what's the theme of Nephi's writing? It's about the goodness of God, the beautifulness of God, the desirability of God. In fact, when we get to 1 Nephi chapter 8 and all, um, and the other chapters that deal with the tree of life, how does Nephi describe the fruit? He describes it with the word beautiful. And if we translated the Book of Mormon back into Egyptian, Nephi would have been using his own name, the meaning of his own name, Nephi, to describe the beautiful fruit from which he and members of his family partook, the Atonement of Jesus Christ. So as you read the Book of Mormon, just remember that it's a beautiful record of God's atonement. It's a witness to you of his goodness. And Nephi's name throughout the record can serve now as a reminder to you to remember the beauty, the goodness, the desirability of the Atonement of Jesus Christ. Now, Nephi introduces us to the, to the language. Verse 2, he says, I make a record in the language of my father, which consists of the learning of the Jews, that would be Hebrew, and the language of the Egyptians. We learn at the very end of the book from Moroni that he's, he says we've modified our spoken Hebrew and we also are writing in Reformed Egyptian. So it's this interesting uh, language situation where Nephi has taken the incredible time and effort to learn from his father not only the, the spoken language of Hebrew, but how to write and read in Egyptian or Egyptian script at least. Uh, this would not have been a simple exercise, but thanks to that effort that he went to, we now have the benefit of the Book of Mormon uh, today because Moroni tells us that if they had written in Hebrew, it would have been too big. It, it won't fit on the plates, but because they're able to write it in Egyptian script, somehow it, it compresses the, the size uh, of the writing and so we can, we can get this, this full record. Then he bears testimony in verse 3, I know that the record which I make is true, and I make it with mine own hand, and I make it according to my knowledge. And then he opens the narrative with verse 4, for it came to pass. You'll notice in the Book of Mormon that there are hundreds of instances of it came to pass in one form or another. This is coming from a language that didn't have punctuation, remember? So in English or in modern languages, we say something and then at the end of what we say, we put in a punctuation mark. They're apparently not doing that. They front load their new thoughts with key words or, or characters. And it came to pass seems to be this equivalent of what we would use a period to end our sentences with. It, and then we're going to go to the next part of the narrative. The next part of the story is moving forward. It came to pass, it came to pass, it came to pass. I love the fact that most trials, tribulations, and difficulties in life come and then they pass. They don't stay. They don't, the storms and the, the hurricanes and tornadoes of life don't constantly keep blowing on most people. Now, there are some exceptions, but for most of us, it's these, these opportunities to grow and see God's hand, they come and then they pass. And, and I know that's not the, the literary intent of that phrase in Scripture. I just love the fact that that most oft-repeated phrase from the Book of Mormon, even that carries with it lessons for our life as we move forward on, on the covenant path. Now, you'll notice the rest of chapter 1 is where Nephi launches into telling us about his father and his writings. So, we're told in chapter 1 verse 17, I shall make an account of my proceedings in my days. Behold, I make an abridgment of the record of my father 
upon plates which I have made with mine own hands. So he tells you, I'm going to abridge the writings from the book of Lehi first, and then I'm going to give you my own stuff. If you look, if you want to cross-reference verse 17 with 1 Nephi chapter 10 verse 1, as well as the last verse of chapter 9, you'll see that at the end of chapter 9, Nephi finished abridging his dad's record, and then in chapter 10, he's, he's no longer reading what his dad wrote and putting it in his own words. He's now just writing his own stuff. The vision that Nephi is given in chapter 1 calls him to be a prophet, to go in and preach to those people in Jerusalem about their wickedness and that they're going to be destroyed. God pulls Lehi out of this comfort zone and says, I, I need you to change um, your, your approach. I need, you to, I need you to be a prophet for me and go in and tell these people what you've seen. So notice verse 19, chapter 1, verse 19. It says, the Jews did mock him because of the things which he testified of them, for he truly testified of their wickedness. Notice this, he says, you're wicked and you're going to be destroyed if you don't repent, and the result was they mocked him. I learned this insight many, many years ago from, from a colleague up at the Logan Institute, Tom Charrington, when he pointed out this change that occurs. Notice it says that at the bottom of verse 19, the things which he saw and heard and also the things which he read in the book manifested plainly of the coming of a Messiah and also the redemption of the world. And when the Jews heard these things, they were angry with him, yea, even as with the prophets of old whom they cast out and whom they had slain. He testified of the coming of a Messiah and now they want to kill him. They don't just want to mock him, they want to kill him. Why? The Messiah is coming. There, there's this phrase in, in antiquity, messianic expectations. It's what do you expect of the promised Messiah? Who is he? What will he do? When will he come? How will he come? What form will he come in? And everybody has these messianic expectations. And Lehi is now saying God is going to come down to the earth, the Messiah is going to come down to the earth and redeem the world, and they get angry with him. They feel like he has now blasphemed God's uh, perfection and his good name. Think about it from this context for a moment. This doctrine as taught in the in the Book of Mormon that God would come down and take upon him flesh and become like us, become a man, is the doctrine of the condescension. You'll notice they don't like this doctrine very much in BC time period and they want to kill Lehi. They feel like he has blasphemed God. How dare you say that God could ever come down and become like us, take upon him flesh like us? He, he, he's not going to do it that way. It's going to be some other way. Isn't it interesting that in BC times, that doctrine causes a lot of problems? Well, what doctrine in relation to this causes problems today or in, in uh, the, the modern era? We would say A.D. Well, could it be that that doctrine right there causes many of our Christian brothers and sisters in the world at large to get frustrated with us because they feel like it's blasphemy that, to say that man and woman could ever become like God? It's the doctrine of deification or exaltation that seems to be problematic for people today in 80 times. Most people don't have a hard time with Jesus Christ being a God who came down and was made flesh, became, became like us, took on a human condition. Now the problem is the companion doctrine. Here is one of the, the beautiful lessons of the Book of Mormon is that the reason Jesus did come down 
and become like us is so that he could not just descend like us but to descend below us to then lift us up. It's not blasphemy for Jesus to say, I'm going to save you. I'm going to lift you up by my mercy, by my merits, by my grace. I'm going to promise you exaltation if you'll just trust me. And that's what happens through this entire Book of Mormon is we learn what those things are that Jesus has asked us to do in order to fully accept him as our Lord and Savior, to allow him to perform this part of the process that completes the cycle that he started with being born all those 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem. Nephi has very clear purposes in why he writes, and he's very explicit about that. If we look at the last verse in this chapter, verse 20, let's read it and carefully and think about what is Nephi trying to convince us of as we read? What did he purposely choose to put into his record and why? And here's what he tells us. When the Jews heard these things from Lehi, they were angry with him, yea, even as with the prophets of old whom they cast out and stoned and slain, and they also sought his life that they might take it away. And now here's the part where Nephi makes it very clear why he's writing his record. And you can look for this, you can test Nephi throughout his writing, how well does he fulfill his purpose that he lays out here. But behold, I, Nephi, will show unto you that the tender mercies of the Lord are over all those whom he hath chosen because of their faith to make them mighty even under the power of deliverance. This statement in summarize, some ways summarizes and encapsulates the totality of Nephi's writings and actually of the Book of Mormon and even the plan of salvation, that God is a God of tender mercies. The Book of Mormon was written to preserve examples of his tender mercies, of how God delivers the faithful. You might remember we talked, uh, we've talked about the two significant covenants, the Abrahamic covenant and the Mosaic covenant. In the Abrahamic covenant, God promised that he would be the God of deliverance. That is his eternal obligation, and he will do that deliverance for all those who are faithful. So just know that God has already promised, long before you were born, to deliver you. Just choose to be faithful to him. And Nephi writes to encourage all of us to be faithful to God, to remember there's all these amazing stories of God's tender mercies. And we might put your minds forward to the end of the Book of Mormon where Moroni asks readers, after having read the entire Book of Mormon, to reflect back on all the tender mercies of God and to ask, is it true, all of his goodness, is it true? Are all of his tender mercies real and true for me? And are all these stories true? Can I trust them? And I know that they are true, and you can find out for yourself through God's promised Holy Spirit that his tender mercies are not simply true for those who live in the past, but are alive and well today. For he is the God of yesterday, today, and tomorrow, never ending for all eternity. Now, chapter one, you get Lehi with his vision of God sitting upon his throne surrounded by numberless concourses of angels in the attitude of singing and praising their God. This this incredible, what we would call a throne theophany, a view of God in the heavens. That's chapter one. Chapter two, you get Lehi who has a dream from God warning him to leave and to, to get out of Jerusalem and take his family out into the wilderness. Uh, notice verse three's wording. It's fascinating. Came to pass, that he was obedient unto the word of the Lord, wherefore he did as the Lord commanded him. Did you notice what just happened? Wherefore creates the same grammatical function pretty much as therefore. It's a cause, effect, connector word. So if you look at what the cause is, what comes right before wherefore? 
Lehi was obedient unto the word of the Lord. What's the effect? He did as the Lord commanded him. Hmm, that's odd. Nephi, why would you why would you take the effort and the time to write something so obvious? My dad was obedient, wherefore he did what the Lord asked him to do, wherefore he was obedient. And it leaves you scratching your head saying, if writing on the plates is so hard, why did you waste your time with that statement? Because it's just so self-evident. A must-have in my mind, cross-reference to verse 3, takes you over to verse 14. Look carefully. Begin at the very bottom of verse 14. Find the wherefore down there at the bottom and circle it. And notice what comes as the effect. What is the outcome? Wherefore, they did as he commanded them. We're speaking of Laman and Lemuel here. So, the outcome is Laman and Lemuel did as they were commanded by Lehi. Hmm, that's interesting because back in verse 3, the outcome was he did as the Lord commanded him. So, it's pretty similar, right? The only difference is they're doing as Lehi commanded them, which makes sense. A prophet getting his marching orders from the Lord, being obedient to the Lord, and they're getting their marching orders from dad, and they're doing it. Look at the cause in verse 14. Look at the first part. It came to pass that my father did speak unto them in the valley of Lemuel with power, being filled with the Spirit, until their frames did shake before him, and he did confound them, that they durst not utter against him. They're scared. They don't, they don't dare uh, say anything against him, wherefore they did as he commanded them. Lehi was obedient, wherefore he did as the Lord commanded him. Laman and Lemuel in verse 14 were scared to death, wherefore they did as their father commanded them. One obedient action seems to lead to greater faith in the Lord and greater discipleship and greater progress along the covenant path, whereas another form of obedience doesn't seem to help propel somebody along that covenant path very far, as, as listed in verse 14. Which brings up this interesting point. Why did God have to make this journey so difficult? They're in Jerusalem, and they're trying to get uh, down to the Red Sea, out into the wilderness, and then three days' journey into the, the wilderness from there. This is a long, difficult, not very pleasant part of the earth to be traveling in if you're, if you're camping. Not the greatest of physical conditions. So this is really hard, and this is just the very beginning. God could have very simply transported them from Jerusalem over to the New World and we would be done. Or he could have made it so that their journey through the wilderness was a journey of absolute ease, but he didn't. He lets it be hard. He lets it be long and grueling because the whole point of the plan of salvation isn't just to get us from where we are to heaven. It's to help us to become something. It's to help us to develop characteristics and traits in our, in our character, in, in our personality, that be, allow us to become more like Christ and to rely more on him through those experiences of life. And so you're going to see these difficulties along the way, and God is going to be stretching every single member of this family, every, um, almost every step of the way, giving them opportunities to become more like the Savior. Notice how in the end of chapter 2, we open up chapter 3 with the Lord speaking yet again to Lehi in a dream. God is, God is directing this, this whole family through, through revelation, and this time it's a dream. We've now made it clear down here and the Lord said, now send your boys back to Jerusalem to get the plates. You can picture Laman and Lemuel that morning, the, the frustration when dad said, hey, I dreamed a dream. 
and I need you boys to go back to Jerusalem to get scriptures so that I can use them to, to teach you from <laughs> not a happy day for Laman and Lemuel from their perspective. Can you imagine the questions they might have asked? Come on, Dad. Why didn't he give you that revelation right here? Or why not a week before we left? Why, why wait? Why make it so hard? And the answer is we don't know why. But we know that God's purpose is not to make our life as easy and simple and problem-free as possible. That isn't why we're here. He's giving us opportunities to stretch our faith, to grow our trust in him as what's happening here in chapter 3. So they go back. Now you'll notice that this whole experience in chapter 3 and 4 is rooted in get the plates, right? They know what they're supposed to do, get the plates. They even know, Nephi even has, I'm going to put as a, as a, uh, semi exclamation mark. He's got some reasons as to why they need the plates. They're going to be able to fill in some, some more of those reasons later on. What don't they know? They don't have any idea how they're going to get the plates. You don't just, you don't just waltz in and take away this incredible uh, family heirloom from Laban. You, you don't just do that. But you'll notice they do the best they can. So attempt number one, they send in Laman. He draws the lot to be the one to get to go in. He asks. He doesn't get the plates. In fact, he's accused by Laban of being a robber and a thief, and he's told that he's going to get killed, which is, by the way, the only thing that Laban is recorded of having actually said his own words in the Book of Mormon are an absolute blasphemy. To falsely accuse somebody who came in, it, this is a very foolish thing for Laban to do, to say, you're a, a robber and a thief and I'm going to slay you. Uh, the grand irony is Laman comes back from that experience and says, well, we tried, that failed, let's go back to the tent, clear down there in the wilderness and tell dad that it didn't work. I love Nephi's uh, response to that. Look at chapter 3, verse 15. But behold, I said unto them, as the Lord liveth, and as we live, we will not go down unto our Father in the wilderness until we have accomplished the thing which the Lord hath commanded us. Because of his famous statement back in verse uh, 7, chapter 3, verse 7, he, he told his father, I know that the Lord giveth no commandments unto the children of men, save he shall prepare a way for them, that they may accomplish the thing which he commandeth them. And he's going to stick to that. He says, yeah, we, we failed, but we only failed if we give up. It's not a failure if we learn from it. So then he says, let's go get all of, all of dad's gold, silver, and precious things. Keep in mind, when they left Jerusalem back in chapter 2, he, he told you a little bit about what that cost the family in verse 4. Chapter 2, verse 4 says, they departed into the wilderness and they left their house, land of his inheritance, his gold, his silver, and his precious things, and took nothing with him save it were his family and provisions and tents, and departed into the wilderness. Brothers and sisters, have you ever considered the fact that God is going to sometimes ask you to let go of earthly possessions like he did with Lehi here? But stop and think about this for a minute. How much gold, how much silver, how many precious things, how much land did Lehi leave behind in Jerusalem in comparison to what he's going to be given in the Promised Land? Uh, and for some, our Promised Land is heaven. For others, the Lord asks you to make earthly sacrifices that seem big, seem uh, almost impossible to accomplish at the time, but then if we trust him and move forward, then he actually gives us more 
than we gave up in this life, in, in a physical context. It's not always just reserved for blessings in heaven in every case. And this is one of those where in an earthly context, yes, Lehi sacrificed a lot, no question about that, but nothing compared to what God has in store for him, not just in, in heaven, but also in, in this life as well. So he's very rich and let's go get the gold, silver, and precious things and bring them in and, and offer to trade for the brass plates. Well, you know that that attempt number two failed yet again. In fact, that's where Laban becomes guilty of the very thing he had falsely accused Laman of. He becomes now a thief and a robber and an attempted murderer. He, he sends his guards to kill these four brothers so the, the possessions fall into the hands of Laban. At that point, we find ourselves in a cave and Laman and Lemuel are pretty upset. Keep in mind, Laman just lost a double portion because he's the oldest son, so he would get a double portion of his father's goods and we've now lost all of that. All of dad's riches are now in the hands of Laban. I wonder, I wonder if there's a possibility that the Lord wanted those riches to be removed from the, the realm of possibility so that when later on we're traveling out in the wilderness and it gets really hard during those eight years, that there's less draw for them to go back to Jerusalem. They're, they're already wanting to return, Laman and Lemuel and some of the sons of Ishmael, but now with the loss of those riches, maybe that draw towards Jerusalem might be just a little bit less. Now, as they're beating up Nephi and Sam with, with sticks in that cave, the angel comes to them and stops them and tells them that they are going to go and get the plates still because at the bottom of verse 29, he promises them, you shall go up to Jerusalem again and the Lord will deliver Laban into your hands. At which point the angel departs and Laman and Lemuel are scratching their heads saying, how is the Lord going to deliver Laban into our hands? Because Laban can command 50. He's got 50 men at his, at his beck and call. How are we going to be able to get him? Can you picture what that might have sounded like from a heavenly perspective where you were up in heaven as an angel, so to speak, in 600 BC? How silly that might have sounded? Seriously? Laban can command 50? <laughs> I love Nephi's uh, faithful example here in chapter 4. He goes and with his brothers outside of the walls of the city, it's night, it's dark, he leaves them there and then he goes into the city. Look at verse 6 of chapter 4. And I was led by the Spirit, not knowing beforehand the things which I should do. I love this part of the story, brothers and sisters, because Nephi still knows what he's supposed to do. He, he knows partly why he needs to do it, but he still has no clue as to what he's going to do in order to get the plates. How do I do this? I tried the two logical things. None of those worked. Have you noticed that sometimes God loves it when we find ourselves in a position where we can no longer rely on the arm of flesh, when we can no longer rely on our best thinking and our own resources and where we can't fix a problem by ourselves, That's exactly where Nephi is right now. He's got nothing other than footsteps of faith into the dark city that night. Look at verse 7, nevertheless. Remember what we said earlier about nevertheless? putting always the greater emphasis on what comes after it, not what came before. What came before? Verse 6 was, I was led by the Spirit not knowing what I should do, basically. He de-emphasizes the fact that he doesn't know what to do and he puts nevertheless emphasis on, I went forth. I love that. I love the fact that he has absolutely nothing to go on other than raw faith alone, but he went on that. He went forth, and as he came forward, he found Laban 
sees his sword, and we get this incredibly difficult situation where all of a sudden God says, Nephi, number three, so this didn't work, that didn't work, I'm going to show you how to get the plates. See that sword? Use it to kill Laban. That introduces a whole new series of questions. But in this context, Nephi now knows what he's supposed to do. He knows how to do it. But now this one becomes a major question mark for him. Why? Why do I have to do this? I've never done anything like this before. God is asking this, this young prophet to, to do something that would be the very hardest possible request you could make of him. And it takes multiple verses here for the Spirit to work with Nephi through this, through this difficult process, at which point he's able to go and get the plates with the help of Zorm, and they, they're able to then go down to the tent of their father in the wilderness in chapter 5. And you'll notice that when they arrive in chapter 5, that Sariah has, has been very sad. It took them a little bit longer than they should have to get the plates, and, and Sariah has obviously been keeping track of the days, and she, she's struggling while they're, while they're gone. She had supposed, you're in chapter 5, verse 2, for she had supposed that we had perished in the wilderness, and she also had complained against my father, telling him that he was a visionary man, saying, Behold, thou hast led us forth from the land of our inheritance, and my sons are no more, and we perish in the wilderness. There are some people who look at this and see Sariah as a weak, uh, lacking faith character. I think it's fascinating that Sariah followed her husband and brought her family out of Jerusalem on his testimony alone. She's trusting him, and it's now taken them a long time to get the plates, and I love the fact that in verse 4, he acknowledges the fact that he is a visionary man, and he reassures her that in verse 5, he has obtained a land of promise, and he bears witness, I know that the Lord will deliver my sons out of the hands of Laban. Now, you'll notice what happens when they come home. Verse 7, when we had returned to the tent of my father, behold, their joy was full and my mother was comforted. You'll notice she wasn't complaining about her own lack of comfort and ease. She was struggling because she was concerned about the safety and the well-being, the, the, the life of her four sons. Look at verse 8, and she spake, saying, Now I know of a surety that the Lord had hath commanded my husband to flee into the wilderness. And I also know of a surety that the Lord hath protected my sons and delivered them out of the hands of Laban, and given them power whereby they could accomplish the thing which the Lord hath commanded them. And after this manner of language did she speak. Let's not focus on a moment where Sariah is struggling as a mother because of the, the concern that she has for the welfare of her sons. I love verse 8 because she says, now I know of a surety these things. Did you notice what just happened? Lehi received his witness early. Sariah receives her witness later. There are scripture stories where sometimes it's the wife who receives the first witness and later on the husband figures some things out. And it, it can go together early and late. But I love the fact that now you have a man and a woman standing at the head of this family who are embarking on this eight-year journey into the wilderness, and then they're going to get on a boat, and then they're going to come to the new world. But you have a husband and a wife who now stand together, having received an independent witness in different ways from God that they are on the Lord's errand. There's something powerful about that about a husband and a wife having a witness from the Lord 
to move their family forward into whatever your wilderness looks like and to seek the Lord's will for progressing towards your promised land. One of the awesome names in the Book of Mormon, I believe, is Sariah. My proposal, and I may be incorrect, but it's my suggestion that Sariah's name may be a representation of Nephi's powerful testimony in 1 Nephi 3.7, where he says, I will go and do the things which the Lord hath commanded. Now, if you look at where Sariah is quoted in 1 Nephi chapter 5, verse 8, she's only quoted twice. And in the second time she's quoted directly, she says in three different ways, that she knows that the Lord gives commandments and that God has the power to prevail, to deliver. Now, it's very interesting. Sariah's name in Hebrew comes from the word Jehovah. This is the shortened form of the word Jehovah in Hebrew. And the word Sar means something like a commander. So you can actually hear that in Nephi's testimony and Sariah's testimony about the power of Jehovah to command. Now, what's also interesting is the word Sar, from Sariah, shows up in the word Israel, Israel, which means God will prevail. So as we think about this, as we are all part of the house of Israel, we're all part of the house of the God who will prevail on our behalf. He will command us, and by so doing, if we follow those commands, He will deliver us. The tender mercies of God are over all those whom He has chosen because of their faith to follow His commands, to make them mighty even under the power of deliverance. That's what a commander does. So I think it's fascinating that Sariah, that the meaning of her name may be one of the most significant messages that Nephi could ever express. I will go and do the things which Jehovah commands me. There's one part of this story that Nephi doesn't tell us about that had to have happened to one degree or another when they came home or came back to the tent with the plates. At some point, there had to be a conversation where Nephi talked to either Lehi or Lehi and Sariah together to say, I need to tell you what I had to go through to get those plates. At which point, I think it becomes very clear to both Lehi and Sariah what God is doing with this family, how how much he is stretching them and reaching in and pulling those heartstrings and and causing them to to uh, trust in and rely on the Lord like never before. The next major story that occurs is when he gets the revelation to send the boys back to Jerusalem yet again. It's this long journey to this time get the family of Ishmael and his daughters and bring them down so that they can have wives. And you'll notice not a lot of complaining from Laman and Lemuel in that chapter. And thus we have this group assembled, including Zoram. We have the brass plates and now we can embark on moving forward into the wilderness on, uh, on our journey toward the Promised Land. In closing today, Brothers and sisters, we have everything we need from the Lord. We have scriptures, we have living prophets, we have loved ones around us and, and local leaders in the church and ministers to help us as we move forward. And keep in mind, God loves you and your progression and, and your potential of who you're becoming much more than he loves your ease and comforts of life today. And so if you're experiencing many afflictions in the course of your days, you're in good company. Our invitation would be to turn that into a nevertheless moment like Nephi did back at the beginning of chapter 1 and see the goodness of God and see his hand guiding you through your wilderness affliction uh, to become more like him. And we leave that with you in the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Amen.